The picture that you can see here shows a typical example of a centrifugal pump. In this configuration, the pump is driven by an electric motor. Here you can see the pump suction. And on this side, the pump discharge. Let's connect a vessel to the suction side. The fluid contained in the vessel arrives at the pump suction nozzle as it flows through the suction piping. The fluid must be available to the pump with sufficient energy so that the pump can work with the fluid's energy. The pump cannot suck on or draw the liquid into the pump. The concept of the fluid being available to the pump will be discussed in detail in the next section. Positive displacement pumps, which represent another category of pump, take the fluid at the suction nozzle and physically capture and contain the fluid in some kind of movable enclosure. The enclosure may be a housing with a pulsing diaphragm or between the teeth of rotating gears, as illustrated in the following two examples. There are actually many designs of positive displacement pumps. The movable enclosure expands and generates a low pressure zone to take the fluid into the pump. The captured fluid is physically transported to the pump from the suction nozzle to the discharge nozzle. Inside the pump, the expanding movable enclosure then contracts or the available space compresses. This generates a zone of high pressure inside the pump and the fluid is expelled into the discharge piping, prepared to overcome the resistance in the system. The flow that a positive displacement pump can generate is mostly a function of the size of the pump housing, the speed of the motor, and the tolerances between the parts in relative motion. The pressure or head that a positive displacement pump can develop is mostly a function of the thickness of the casing, the tolerances, and strength of the pump components. As the pump performs its duty over time and fluid passes through the pump, Erosion and abrasive action will cause the close tolerance parts to wear. These parts may be piston rings, reciprocating rod seals, a flexible diaphragm, or meshed gear teeth. As these parts wear, the pump will lose its efficiency and ability to pump. These worn parts must be changed with a degree of frequency based on time and the abrasive and lubricating nature of the fluid. Changing these parts should not be considered as breakdown maintenance. Nothing here is broken. This periodic servicing is actually a production function to return the pump to its best or original efficiency. Centrifugal pumps also require that the fluid be available to the pump suction nozzle with sufficient energy. Centrifugal pumps cannot suck on or draw the liquid into the pump housing. Take a look at the following figure. It shows a cross-sectional view of a typical centrifugal pump. The suction nozzle is now highlighted here, as well as the discharge nozzle. The principal pumping units of a centrifugal pump are the volute and the impeller. Shown now on screen, the front view of the volute impeller assembly with the discharge nozzle. In a centrifugal pump, the impeller is attached to a shaft. The shaft spins and is powered by an electric motor or driver. We use the term driver because some centrifugal pumps are attached to pulleys or transmissions. The fluid enters into the eye of the impeller, which is highlighted here, and is trapped between the impeller blades. The impeller blades contain the liquid and impart speed to it as the liquid passes from the impeller eye toward the outside diameter of the impeller. This is depicted in the following figure. As the fluid accelerates in velocity, a zone of low pressure is created in the eye of the impeller, according to the Bernoulli's principle. As velocity goes up, pressure goes down. This is another reason the liquid must enter into the pump with sufficient energy. The liquid then leaves the outside diameter of the impeller at a high rate of speed, which corresponds to the speed of the motor, and then immediately slams into the internal casing wall of the volute. At this point, the liquid's centrifugal velocity comes to an abrupt halt, and the velocity is converted into pressure. This time, according to the reverse of the Bernoulli's principle. As velocity goes down, pressure goes up. Because the motor is spinning, there is also rotary velocity. The fluid is conducted from the cut water around the internal volute housing 
in an ever-increasing escape channel. As the pathway increases, the rotary velocity decreases. And even more energy and pressure are added to the liquid, according to the Bernoulli's principle. The liquid leaves the pump at discharge pressure. Prepared to overcome the resistance in the system. The flow from a centrifugal pump is mostly governed by the speed of the driver and the height of the impeller blades. The pressure or head that these types of pumps can generate is mostly governed by the speed of the motor and the diameter of the impeller. Other factors play a lesser role in the pump's flow and pressure, like the number, pitch, and thickness of the impeller blades, as well as the internal clearances and the presence and condition of the wear bands. These factors will be covered in detail further ahead. To sum up, we could say in simple terms that positive displacement pumps perform work by manipulating the available space inside the pump. On the other hand, centrifugal pumps perform work by manipulating the velocity of the fluid as it moves through the pump.